Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Eric Harrison uh, on uh, the WFL HCA. Uh, today, uh, we have a guest speaker who is our cardiac fellow, uh, Nigel Niwaz. And uh, this has been a very interesting uh, last week because there was a big breakthrough on Parkinson's disease and its relationship to microbiota and uh, motor dysfunction. And so that's very interesting because uh, we've been interested in the microbiota and the work of Dr. Stanley Hazen in Cleveland Clinic, who's going to be here May 12th at 12 noon as our guest speaker for the annual Enrique Lopez Innovative and Humanitarian Conference. And so we're really looking forward to that. And so in preparation for that, we thought we would combine the two and talk about ASIN, which uh, is related to Parkinson's disease and the microbiota, and then TAMAO, T-M-A-O, which is related to coronary artery disease, kidney disease, congestive heart failure, and the microbiota. So this is a, a big change from us since we usually talk about advanced cardiac imaging. But uh, markers have always been very important to us, and we've actually started using Tamayo in the office. We've not had an elevated Tamayo yet, but we've only done about six tests. And so we're uh, doing that through the Cleveland Heart Lab. So um, let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'll introduce uh, Nigel uh, Narwaz, uh, Dr. Narwaz. Uh, let's see what kind of insights you have about microbiota, which seems to be a long way off from uh, heart disease and cardiac imaging. So you're going to clue us in on that. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nigel Nawaz. I'm a third year cardiology fellow um, at Northside Hospital in St. Petersburg. Um, I have a strong interest in prevention. And um, this, we'll get started there. Um, so brief overview of what I'll be talking about today is microbiota, basically what is microbiota, um, its role in central nervous system and specifically Parkinson's disease, as well as Tamayo um, and Tamayo's relationship in cardiovascular disease and possible therapeutic options. Um, so what is microbiota? Um, Joshua Lederberg summarizes it as a ecological community of uh, commensural, symbiotic, and um, pathologic microorganisms that we literally share our body. Um, these include bacteria, fungi, and archaea. Um, and in humans, uh, microbiota and microbiome sometimes are in, used interchangeably, but specifically your human microbiome refers to the genome sequence of these um, uh, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and archaea. Uh, and there's a mutualistic relationships with um, microbiota and the human host. And some of these organisms perform um, tasks that is useful to the human host. Um, and under normal circumstances, thought that these um, microorganisms do not cause um, disease, but new data suggesting that they, they do. Um, so this is a good article I actually found in Cell Magazine, which is a summary of central nervous system and the gut microbiome. Um, it was published earlier this year. So basically neurological developments um, are both affected by intrinsic and ex extrinsic signals. And the extrinsic signals come from the periphery um, and can impact neurological conditions. And studies have shown that can influence anxiety, depression, um, and autism, autism spectrum disorders. Um, there are pre and post natal events um, that is involved in molecular signals from the gut, and specifically these are come, would come from microbiome, um, primarily bacteria is what I've been seeing in my reading, um, and they play a role in um, physiologic changes such as uh, formation of blood-brain barrier, myelination, neurogenesis, and uh, microglia maturation. Um, neurological development does not stop postnatally, but actually continues until adolescence and um, early adulthood. And I've done studies looking at germ-free versus conventional mice, so um, basically mice that were um, either given antibiotics or did not have any um, germs in, within their gut, and they showed that there's an increased risk of hyperreactivity, um, learning and memory deficits in the germ-free versus the conventional mice. There have also been noted changes in uh, serotonin receptor 
HT1A and um, the NMDA receptors in the hippocampus. And it, studies have also shown that microbiota plays a role in um, blood-brain barrier um, formation. So uh, pay, um, mice that did not have microbiome um, and microbial metabolites uh, had more permeable um, blood-brain barriers versus the conventional mice, and this is a result of less tight gap junction, um, tight junction proteins. And I've also noted increased myelination in the prefrontal cortex in the germ-free mice in other studies. Um, so I think this is a good summary slide of um, germ-free versus the conventional mice. So this is basically showing that the microbiome um, produce uh, metabolic precursors, um, such as fatty acids, and through immune signal and, and interaction with the vagus nerve, they're able to um, communicate with the, um, the brain. And here you have the germ-free mice and specific pathogen-free mice. After colonization with um, short-chain fatty acids from uh, microbiome, you can see increase in occluding, which is involved in the blood-brain barrier formation. I'm also a neurogenesis, so if you have um, germ-free mice versus um, specific pathogen-free mice and you gave them antibiotics, you could see that there's a uh, decreased neurogenesis in the hippocampus. I'm also germ-free mice versus um, s specific pathogen-free mice. You can see that there is, um, after they, they were given um, colonization, or administration of uh, short-chain fatty acids from the microbiome that it was able to change the immune response. So it's this uh, communication between the gut and the neural axis um, is quite intricate, and I think we're still starting to understand um, the entire process and its relation to microbiome. Um, and over time, also, the, the host bacteria changes over time. So primarily in um, urine gestation is lactobacillus in the vaginal and acinobacter um, in the gut. And I've read that the studies, some studies have shown that actually the, the fetus is not sterile, but there is some interaction with the maternal gut and um, microbiome. And um, so basically a brief overview of prenatal brain development. So um, Cynobacter and proteobacteria um, are increasing the tri third trimester compared to that of the first, and it's thought that this may play a role in um, fetal development um, within the third trimester. And that it's shown that uh, perinatal administration of antibiotics uh, affects the status of um, both the host, well, both the mother and um, its offsprings. And antibiotics that were given to rodents had uh, anxiety-like behavior and deficits in locomotion. Also, um, diet changes the maternal gut and the microbial population, um, which in turn affects the offspring. So there's association with, between maternal diabetes and autism, autism spectrum disorder, um, diagnosis in children, and maternal, uh, a high-fat maternal diet. Um, mice of those um, Mice of those uh, mothers showed less social and more repetitive behavior versus control. And these changes were um, reversed by uh, administration of lactobacillus, which is missing in the high-fat um, diet. So again, you, as you can see here, the microbiome within um, humans change over time from birth, um, one year, and three years. And then as you become older, the microbiome species continue to change. Um, so postnatal development uh, is governed by synaptic development and environmental changes. So long-term antibiotics in adult mice decreased neurogenesis in the hippocampus of adult mice, which in turn led to deficits in task recognition. And exercise and administration of probiotics were able to reverse these changes, indicating that antibiotics was leading to um, decrease in gut microbiome was likely the cause. And interaction between gut microbiome and um, also modulates uh, myelination. So myelination, 
After mice were treated with antibiotics, myelation transcript increased in the prefrontal cortex, where was not, this was not seen in other uh, brain regions. So um, treatment and um, its relation to treatment with antibiotics and its relation to microbiome in um, mice and humans have been seen in studies. So uh, antibiotics given to offsprings of mice exhibited um, anxiety and hypoactivity as well as decreased sociability. High fight diet, as I mentioned, was related to social deficits and repetitive behavior. Um, and antibiotics um, postnatally have also been shown to be related to uh, cognitive deficits. Um, Germ-free animals also had deficits in uh, memory formation. So these changes occur prenatally and can affect postnatally. Um, probiotic administration have been shown to rescue um, some of these changes that have occurred as a result of either antibiotics or in germ-free mice. Um, specifically, lactobacillus was shown to reverse the social deficits in uh, mice. Um, so briefly, I'll go over also uh, microbiotic role in neuroinflammation um, in a Parkinson's uh, disease um, in a mouse model. So Parkinson's disease briefly is a common neurodegenerative disorder affecting approximately one million of the U.S. population and 1% of uh, those greater than 60 years old uh, affects 3 million people worldwide. Uh, micro, uh, actually multi-factor, it is a multifactorial disorder that has a strong environmental component with only 10% of cases being hereditary. Uh, and the thought is that uh, aggregation of ACIN or a alpha synuclein is thought to be the pathologic, um, play a pathologic role uh, in these synopathies, which include Parkinson's as well as Lewy body disease and uh, multi-system atrophy. Uh, so ag aggregation of ACIN is, um, leads to um, oligometric species that are um, intransient fibers accumulating within the neurons and Dopaminergic neurons that are uh, responsible for Parkinson's disease appear to be very vulnerable to these aggregation of ACIN, um, leading to the motor dysfunction. And early studies have shown that fecal uh, muc uh, mucosal associated gut microbes were different between Parkinson's patients versus those of healthy controls in both humans and um, animal models. Um, one of the hypotheses of this um, propagates to um, the brain is that uh, there's some connection within the uh, vagus system. So mice that were vagotomized um, had a reduced risk of Parkinson's disease even though they're, um, they had accumulation of ACEN. An injection of ACEN fibers into the gut tissue of healthy rodents was enough to induce pathology within the vagus nerve and brain stem. Um, so this uh, study specifically used uh, mice, well, transgenic mice that overexpressed um, ACEN versus wild-type mice. And um, the conclusions that they saw were that microbiota was necessary for um, the promoting the ACEN pathology, neuroinflammation, and characteristic features um, seen in Parkinson's. So administration of um, microbiota of the short-chain fatty acids produced by microbes in the gut um, to germ-free mice uh, was able to pr uh, promote neuroinflammation and features seen in Parkinson's and potential this lead, um, led them to conclude that there's a po potential molecular mediator involved in uh, the gut-brain signaling. Uh, colonization, colonization of ACEN mice express um, with microbiota from Parkinson's uh, patients also enhanced the physical impairments versus microbiota from healthy uh, donors. So basically, ACEN mice were given um, microbiota from Parkinson's patients versus normal patients, and the ones that were given uh, 
microbiota from Parkinson's patient had an increase in Parkinson's features versus those from healthy donors. And germ-free mice or um, mice that were treated with antibiotics that overexpressed ASIN had reduced uh, microglial activation and ASIN inclusions uh, as well as motor deficits versus animals with complex microbiota. So, um, indicating that their microbiota played a significant role in the disease process. Uh, and finally, microbiota compared to healthy controls such as that ASIN um, overexpression from uh, genetics and mic microbiota from the environment combined to influence disease. So both the genetic component as well as the strong envir environmental component um, played a role in Parkinson's disease in these mice. Um, so this is a good summary slide, I thought. Uh, so you have your typical microbiota, um, and by some means of short-chain fatty acid signaling led to motor dysfunction and pathology. If these short-chain fatty acids were not present um, in the germ-free mice, then there was limit, limited um, pathophysiology um, because the signaling pathway was sort of blocked because you're not producing these short-chain fatty acids um, in a germ-free gut. But uh, mice that had um, Parkinson's derived microbiota had enhanced motor dysfunction um, in both germ-free and uh, ASIN transgenic mice. Um, so I'll go over briefly also Tamayo and its role in cardiovascular disease. Um, and possible therapeutic uh, th treatments. So, Tamaya was a small colorless uh, amino oxide generated from choline, um, carnitine uh, by gut microbial metabolism. It's known to protect against the adverse effects of temperature, salinity, high urea, and hydrostatic pressures. And studies in sharks have actually demonstrated a, a, this. Urea this destabilizes destabilizes uh, molecular structures and inhibits cellular functions such as ligand binding. So these effects were counteracted by Tamayo, and Tamayo has been shown to restore proteins to their native structure um, and re leading to re gaining enzymatic function that was lost in the presence of urea. So basically, Tamayo counteracts the effects of um, urea. Uh, so the biosynthesis of Tamayo I have um, briefly updated, so you have trimethylamine, which is um, converted to uh, trimethylamine oxide by an enzyme present in bacteria. And so the precursors, usually choline, lectin, um, carnitine, these things are found in red meats, eggs, dairy products, and saltwater fish. Um, microbiome in generating tamayo, uh, so their role is to Tamayo is dependent really on the metabolism of the intestinal microbiota. Um, and plasma levels of Tamayo were suppressed by oral administration of broad spectrum antibodies. So by knocking out uh, the microbiota in the gut, you were able to decrease the levels of Tamayo. Several families of bacteria have been shown to play a role in Tamayo production, which I've listed here below. Um, Determinants of Tamayo level um, include um, diet, uh, the gut microbiome, flora, liver, and kidney function. Um, diet containing Tamayo precursors such as egg, beef, fish. Um, increased blood level of Tamayo. And these changes are actually seen within 15 minutes of food consumption, indicating that Tamayo can also be directly absorbed without um, processing by microbes. There is no sex difference in the levels of Tamaya, but these levels do increase in age. Um, Tamaya levels are also affected by uh, renal function. So Tamaya is strongly associated with a degree of renal function. For example, uh, in 235 patients that underwent di hemodialysis, they measured Tamaya levels um, prior to and after hemodialysis, and they compared um, levels in hemodialysis patients were higher in, versus patients with normal or close to normal GFR, and there was a 60% reduction in plasma TMA and Tamayo um, post-hemodialysis. 
uh, hemodialysis um, levels, pulse hemodialysis levels were similar to that of control subject. And um, they've also seen that successful kidney transplant reduced um, to my level concentrations. Um, it's rolling cardiovascular disease. There are actually several. So uh, to my levels are increased in patients that um, are diabetic versus euglycemic patients. So these were diabetic patients that underwent coronary angiography and patients with um, high glucose levels versus euglycemic patients had higher to my levels. Um, it's also been shown to impair glucose tolerance, inhibit hepatic insulin signaling and promote adipose tissue inflammation in mice on high fat and sugar diets. So likely a role in metabolic syndrome as well. Um, Tamayo plasma levels in APOE deficient mice positively correlated also with atheroma burden and choline diet which leads to uh, production of uh, Tamayo increased foam cell which uh, plays a role in atherosclerotic heart disease. Um, and high choline and biotin diet was also associated with future risk of cardiac events um, only when the, there was an increase in Tamayo. Tamayo, also levels have, Tamayo levels have also been seen to be increased in um, heart failure patients and elevated levels were associated with increased mortality. Um, so this is a good graph I thought that um, showed Tamayo's interaction with several body organs and its role in cardiovascular disease. So basically you have the precursor um, leads to um, Tamayo production from the gut uh, from choline, L-carnitine. Um, that decreases uh, bile acid production and you also get uh, CKD. Tamayo's increase in Tamayo levels has been associated with CKD production. Um, atherosclerosis uh, with increase in foam cells, um, MI, metabolic syndrome, um, and type 2 diabetes. Um, and it was one animal study looking at uh, Tamayo levels um, and diet containing the precursors of Tamayo, choline, which uh, have shown to have increase in cardiac events, they had um, increased myocardial fibrosis. So basically they took three sets of mice um, and they were either administered a regular diet, um, choline diet, and Tamayo diet, um, after which they, actually prior to which they did transferred aortic constriction um, and heart function was measured uh, three at, at three week intervals with echocardiography. Um, Twelve week post aortic uh, constriction, the mice were studied and um, myocardial tissue was um, studied for uh, vascular fibrosis and they also measured levels of Tamayo, choline, and BNP in these mice and you have noted that significant increase in pulmonary edema, cardiac enlargement, and um, changes in EF were higher in the choline supplemented or the Tamayo mice. Uh, myocardial fibrosis is also greater in the Tamayo or and choline mice versus the, that of control. So this is a good representation of the BMP. As you can see here, control mice with normal diet versus the Tamayo and choline supplemented mice um, had higher BMP levels as well as more fibrosis. So control versus choline and Tamayo mice. Um, and here's the pathology here. You can see the fibrosis. Um, highest in the Tamayo uh, mice. Its uh, role in atherogenesis is not fully understood, but there's several proposed mechanisms: so cholesterol and serial me metabolism, reverse um, cholesterol transport is inhibited, um, promotion of foam cells leading to atherosclerosis, and alternations in the bile acid metabolism and excretion of cholesterol from the liver. Um, so. Tamayo is upregulated by, uh, sorry, Tamayo um, upregulates uh, macrophage scavenger receptors and that's thought to be linked to atherosclerosis and these were this was um, from a study seen in mice. Dietary supplementation with Tamayo in mice and carnitine also decreased reverse um, cholesterol transport from um, 
flags that were present, and studies in mice and culture human uh, aortic endothelial and vascular smooth muscle cells show that uh, physiologic levels of Tamiya was able to induce inflammatory cytokines and adhesion molecules. Um, and also bile, as I mentioned, play a role in cholesterol elimination from the liver. So the liver levels of bile acid enzymes and bile acid transporters were reduced in mice that was treated with Tamiya. Um, dietary supplementation with Tamiya also reduced expression of um, the Neiman PIC C1 uh, transporter, which is the same enzyme that um, is uh, affected by Zedia. So they noted that there was a um, significant uh, reduction in cholesterol absorption. However, these changes um, did not show any significant Sorry, these changes um, did not significantly affect um, macrophages in atherosclerosis, even with the treatment of Tamiya. Um, plasma Tamiya levels is also a predictor of thrombosis in humans, so gut-derived Tamiya um, enhanced plasma responsiveness um, and leads to activation from multiple agonists through a, a um, calcium release from intracellular stores. So Tamiya levels have been noted to be elevated um, in acute thrombosis. Uh, however, not all studies of Tamiya have shown a, its association with atherosclerosis. So they did an um, eight-year follow-up of patients that had um, angiographic CAD um, and history of MI, and they did not show any increase of events in patients um, with uh, plasma levels of Tamiya or b um, Also, Tamiya levels in, um, they looked at Tamiya levels in HIV males and coronary disease, and they showed that patients that um, had stenosis had a elevation in Tamiya levels in the second and third quartiles, but not the first and fourth quartiles, so there was sort of a U-shape. Um, distribution in terms of Tamayo and coronary stenosis. Um, so the thought is, could Tamayo actually be a bystander, or could it be a marker of disease, but not a actual cause of disease? And studies have shown that Tamayo is increased in fish. However, um, by consuming fish, there's not an increase in um, heart disease, which is seen in meta-analysis the concluded fish um, consumption was inversely related to coronary disease. Um, and also in the physician health study, um, fish consumption was also a, uh, also correlated to lower risk of cardiovascular disease. And there was also another study that um, looked at Tamiya levels and showed that Tamiya levels were actually um, inversely co correlated to atherosclerotic lesions in the aorta. So, one thought is that maybe it's protective after you have had disease already. Um, so possible therapeutic strategies. Uh, so one is reducing intake of red meat um, and L-carnitine. That's one way of reducing tamayo, um, as well as eggs and fish. Resveratrol also, which is found in um, wine and grapes, decreased tamayo levels in mice. And DMB, which is found in red wine, balsamic vinegar, and olive oils, promote reduction in the uh, microbiomes known to produce um, Tamayo in the gut. And assuming that uh, microbiome is the main source of Tamayo, broad spectrum antibiotics is um, shown to decrease levels, and, and these levels have increased after step in um, the antibiotic curve. This is not really a feasible treatment because it will lead to resistance of uh, bacteria. Use of um, selected bacteria that increased Tamayo metabolism. So certain bacteria use Tamayo as a, um, use Tamayo in their uh, electrotransport chain. And by um, colonizing with those bacteria, the thought is maybe you can reduce Tamayo levels. Um, so antibiotics decrease levels of um, plasma Tamayo. However, this is nonspecific. Um, microbiomes can use can be used to reduce Tamayo levels, uh, decrease uh, 
consumption of the precursors such as choline, L-carnitine, um, resveratrol found in wine. Um, also, there is also a enzyme that plays a role in t converting TMA to, to myo. And, however, this has been shown not to be very useful because it's, this particular enzyme regulates uh, metabolism, lipid metabolism and inflammation. Um, so I think the these this is a good overview, but I think that, that we still have a long way to go, that there is a, a lot to be still studied and fully understand the mechanism of tamayo and heart disease um, and microbiota and several other diseases. Um, I think we're still in the infant stages of all the research, and I think this will be an exciting topic, especially in prevention in the years to come. Thank you. So thank you, Nigel. And so we've got, uh, interestingly, there's already a test released for Tamayo that's available through the Cleveland Heart Lab. And so if someone comes out, has that test, and has a high Tamayo level, uh, what would you recommend doing for them, Nigel, after you've had this overview? If, um, say, if they have coronary artery disease uh, with calcific plaque uh, on their coronary CTA, or say they have coronary disease with uh, some risky high necrotic core plaque, or say they don't have coronary disease, what do you do when you have a high Tamayo level? So far, I haven't had to face that choice because all the Tamayo tests we've done have been low. But the test is now available, marketed by the Cleveland Clinic. And so after your reading, what do we do with this test? Establish heart disease. I think, I mean, we have several therapies now with four lowering cholesterol levels. I mean, there's been a lot of studies looking at APOL levels, LDL, um, and, and aggressively treating those um, to, to numbers that are well below the recommendation of 70. Um, studies have shown that there's a linear relationship with LDL and um, atherosclerotic heart disease and um, cardiac events. So I think if they do have established disease in the setting where elevated might you should treat them very aggressively. Uh, in patients that have no established disease, so no plaque or um, disease seen on the calcium score, I would I would probably also recommend to treat them aggressively because it, it could either be a marker of disease or it could be um, play a role in this, the disease process itself. So it, it is elevated. That indicates that either that they have diseases has not been established yet um, or, uh, well, actually they may have disease that's not established yet. So treating them aggressively with statins and lipid-lowering therapy um, as well as um, education and, and all the harmful effects of red meat. Um, so I think that's what I would tell them. So based on your studies, the question becomes is, what's the best diet? And as we know from all of the studies that have been done on CT scanning of mummies using mummies from uh, Egyptian tombs, mummies from Mayans, from southwest arid zones, Aleutian Islands, uh, and the uh, Austrian Iceman. All of those mummies, if you're over age of 40, there's a 37% increase of atherosclerosis of the coronary arteries with CT scan. So these are people that have had exposure to varying diets. That there's a paleo diet involved. There's a, a total fish diet in the Aleuts. There's a sort of a, a rich Egyptian diet. Austrians, uh, he actually, they could analyze the contents of his stomach and uh, see what he'd been eating, some tubers and stuff. And so uh, we've got all this information, but we really don't know what to do. And it seems that coronary artery disease and it is an endemic disease going back at least 6,000 years in people, no matter what their diet is. And so, what are, you, what are your comments about diet now for all of us based on at least some scientific data of which mostly diets have been fatism, 
are they've been mostly um, not science, uh, but uh, certainly very thin science. So um, the Cochrane Review has shown very little double-blind, randomized, uh, controlled studies of diet that's useful. And so what would you recommend based on this uh, information about diet? Um, I guess with regards to diet, I, I think that the fact that um, the most common cause of mortality in the United States versus all the other malignancies is coronary heart disease. And I think a large part of that play comes from the, the American diet, which is high in carbohydrates, um, saturated fats, um, pretty much each of our meal is, is composed of, of some sort of meat, whether it's sausage for breakfast, uh, burger for lunch, or a steak for dinner. So I think um, one is portion control, two is um, cutting back on, on animal fats, um, study looking at uh, diets composed of um, animal fat versus um, fish or vegetarian, the lowest incidence of coronary disease um, and well, actually, lowest levels of cholesterol we're seeing in patients with um, vegetables and fish in their diet, and not so much um, animal fat. Um, and also, being cognizant of portion, um, and also uh, carbohydrates, because studies have shown that higher carbohydrates are associated with more atherogenic um, LDL particles. So. Uh, I think we, we have a lot of data as to say what, what we do know is that high cholesterol is bad, um, small LDL particles is bad, and by lowering that we can um, lower the risk of coronary disease. Uh, and with regards to, uh, to Maya, we see that it is associated with increased risk or either by uh, causing atherosclerosis by increased macrophages, um, bone cells, or a marker of disease. So by decreasing red meat and eggs, things that are known to be um, causes of atherosclerosis, then we can decrease the risk of disease. So I had my tomato checked, and my tomato level was low. So can I eat anything I want to eat then? Um, your tomato level is low. I, I mean, I think you should keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> okay. And so um, now deep sea cold water fish like cod that are uh, free running fish in the deep sea apparently have high tomato levels that helps them maintain uh, warmth and uh, keep from freezing. And so that's pretty, pretty important for them. Here in Florida, our warm water fish don't have any TMA in them, TMA. And so would you recommend restricting uh, eating of free swimming cold water fish? Um, I like fish, so I wouldn't restrict uh, eating fish, um, no matter where they're from. Uh, probably fishes that, um, I guess, have elevated to my levels, it's, it's probably mechanistically different um, for them than, than for us. It's been shown to, to help with the hydrostatic pressures in sharks, for example, but its role in, in humans is still not well understood. So um, if you're going to not eat fish, people are going to end up supplementing that with some other form of protein, such as um, animal fats and beef. So I would su suggest not changing that diet until we fully understand Tamaya's role. So the mummified Aleutian Islanders had just as much coronary artery disease, over 40, as Mayans, um, Egyptians, uh, people uh, in southwest United States uh, that were mummies. Uh, what do you make of that? All he ate was fish. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I've reviewed all the diets, and none of the diets make any sense at all. And uh, this is starting to make some sense, but it's very little data. It looks very important to understand the microbiota.
perhaps in all diseases. And so we've just started doing whole microbiome genetic analysis on people, which is kind of cool, uh, finding out what's normal, and then using uh, germ-free mice and using that as a model uh, for each type of disease. It sounds like these two instances that we've stumbled upon are extremely important. It sounds like we need to do this for many, many disease states that we don't understand. What do you think about that? That's a lot of people. I mean, I, th I think if we are able to do it and we understand which ones are specifically causing diseases, then we can sequence those specific genes from the microbiota. Um, I think we're still at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, my testing is not available, uh, for example, everywhere. Um, genetic testing is still not available for many common diseases that, that we treat nowadays that we have a better understanding of, such as um, familiar hyperlipidemia syndromes. And I think that um, as we move forward and we, we start the sequencing microbiome DNA, we're probably going to be able to find which um, microbiome genes specifically are probably related to um, diseases in humans, not just cardiac diseases, but Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, etc. Several disease processes are probably related to um, what we eat because that also affects the microbiota and also exposure in um, our microbiota. So it's kind of a craze as usual with diets which become fads. And so the latest fad is probiota. Any comments? Um, actually, so reading this, it showed that the administration of probiotics have reverse changes. Um, and in the short chain fatty acids from microbiota have also re reverse changes. So I mean, maybe there is actually some role in probiotics in disease. In preventing disease or in promoting disease? Probably preventing, because in that one study looking at uh, uh, prenatals and given um, lactobacillus, they were able to, to reverse diseases. Yeah. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, Nigel uh, for his presentation. It brings up a lot of questions. And so we invite you to come to our conference May the 12th at 12 noon where Dr. Stanley Hazen, Stanley Hazen is going to speak uh, about Tamayo and coronary artery disease, and hopefully we'll find out a lot more about uh, Parkinson's disease and the microbiota contribution. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. See you next week. Bye-bye.